another of our Bible studies, Unfolding Truth. Last week, we were in the book of Luke. We want to welcome those who are online, both on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and everywhere else. We want to re remind you that we are now at Luke chapter 14, and we're at verse 15. But before we get into the word, we need, you know, to recapture for those who missed last week so that they can not feel lost. Recapture some of what we said last week. So please. All right. Um, one of the mem one of the thing I remember last week was the, 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 the Pharisees. Jesus was invited to one of the leaders of the Pharisees' house. And um, somebody said that them up in them game. The game, they must step up them game. Because now, them get the leaders involved. But they, they were very careful in planning what... In, 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 in trying to trap Jesus in that they set... Somebody who was sick right in front of where Jesus was. And um, when, ready now? Let's go ahead. No, no, I, I, I was. Let's go ahead. Right. Yes, so. Um, they set their trap they placed somebody who was sick right in front of Jesus somebody who wouldn't have normally been in the house of, of a leader of the Pharisee and also when Jesus asked them is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath they did not say anything. Reason being, if they said yes, it would have thwarted their own plans. And if they said no, then they figured Jesus might not have healed, so they wouldn't have anything to accuse him about. Yeah. The, the only thing I have to add to that is... Probably some um, facts, I suppose, because my dad said most of what I would have said. Um, this was Jesus' seventh Sabbath day healing. And where is it? Yeah, the, the, the parable or the story about the taking the lowly places. Okay. Um, yeah, looking back at this, 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 that parable throughout the week, it was interesting for me that the seats or where you put this now. It was interesting that it wasn't so much about the position of the seat as much as the intention behind going after the seat, and yeah that made me kind of stop to think about this week um why i'm doing what i'm doing instead of what i'm actually doing i'm focusing a bit more on my intents instead of um i suppose providing eye service so yeah all right one thing i um one of the takeaways from last week was Um, um, basically, um, inviting or, how do I say that? Thinking of, as Israel said, um, the purpose, the intention behind what we do, what was pointed out to us last week was the fact that most times when we offer help or assistance, it's to those who we can get back something from. You know, I invite Andrine over for dinner because I know Andrine can invite me and she can carry my places. 
but I wouldn't dare to invite Chris because Chris not a money. Chris can't invite me back out nowhere. So, you know, and we were reminded that really our intentions need to be pure and we must think of those who can't give, grant us back favor, right? In other words, when, you, when, when you're doing um, your good deeds, don't do it for a return from the person or for others looking on. Do it from a place to persons who you know genuinely have the need. See, so inviting over somebody for dinner, what about the last person you would think of? Invite them because they might truly need it. That was the takeaway. What I remember from last week, we also spoke about the idea of cliques and we being comfortable in our own cliques and not necessarily expanding that circle. So after church, we just go to those who we are familiar with versus seeing someone who is here for the first time or even someone that we have never spoken to and go to them. And that was something that did come out, even with that part following up on what Dacia had said, that's something in our um, applying to us now here at EDF. And funnily enough, on Sunday, mm. <laughs> on Sunday we saw everyone just go back, even those who were at Bible study, just go back to, even me, to who we were comfortable with. Everybody <laughs> did. I, I, I want to dig a little deeper. Because usually when we, when we go to these passages and we're recollecting, we do a lot of recall. Yeah? And, and, and the whole idea of, of, of synthesizing, the whole idea of making it part of, of how does that impact my life. We, we talk about clique through the passage and cliqueism and how, how that um, looks and how wrong that might be. Why? Why? Because until we get to the why, and until we make it make sense, we're going to have what you see mm -hmm. on Sunday. Because for us, it's just about the what. We have not connected to the heart of why this is so ungodly. We just see it as a clickism thing, and it's not something social to do. But what is at the heart of clickism. What's at the heart of that? Selfishness? Mm, could be. It's divisive. It is divisive. It calls upon us to exclude. And us is a ministry of reconciliation. To bring those without within the, the family of God and those within the family of God to have that kind of embrace. And as being imitators of Christ, that is what we're called to, to embrace. The mindset and the attitude we're called to embrace. And so yes, I recall that this is something about clickism. But why is this important for us to recall? And must, why must we renew our minds around it? So that, remember what, what we're doing, this unfolding truth, is not necessarily for our knowledge, you know, but for changed behavior. When we learn, we change behavior. That's the goal of learning. Yeah? Sorry. Oh, that's good. Need to be interested. Why, sorry. <laughs> I was wondering how long it was going to take for us to get to it because we spent a considerable amount of time discussing that. You know, um, it ends up divisive, but the heart of it is that it is not embracing. It is not demonstrating love. It is not, what is that word called that we so pronounce to the guest services people? What's the Greek word? Hmm? Felixina, what is that? The embracing of strangers. You know, and that is the heart of ministry. We embrace those that are unloved. We embrace those that are 
out of place we embrace those that feel well them in a strange place and Sunday you know the Lord gave us the opportunity to, to do that and um, we Squad feel daddy. that it miserably Squad daddy. yeah we feel that it miserably twice in both services I had to announce remember what we talked about in Bible study on Friday twice both services we, we can't continue to do that we say after we read the scripture on Sunday um, all that it says what uh, we will do, do and obey, obey. I will do and obey where's the obedience and where's the doing I, I want to say one more thing because I missed to study my fault is not only no fault but I need to vomit what on my chest since I missed the um, last two now Troy said something that was very instructive at the beginning about this one little man who had dropsy mm -hmm. that was invited in the space. Yeah. Right. He was invited in the space, Troy. And yes, if we talk about maybe it might be to trick Jesus, but I want us to also understand that this idea of embrace too is not a tokenism kind of thing. It's not the one little man with the liquor issue that you decide to put in the group. It's an intentional kind of thing to break the back of clickism. Yeah? Because they had this one little man there, and whether used to say, see, we have like one little smart in between us, uh, we're nice and we're wonderful, or it's a trick Jesus. Whatever the intention was behind it, our tokenism would not work in, our, in God's call on us to be embracing and to demonstrate love. It must be intentional, not an activity we do to tick a box. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Miss Bible study in three weeks, don't you don't remember saying, right, you're sorry. contrary to not saying sorry. <laughs> All right, we're at verse 15 of chapter 14. But before you go, uh, Glenisha online says her takeaway was the seven types of Pharisees. Yes, so, oh yes, we discussed that too. Right, so sometimes just using the term Pharisee can be general. But the breakdown gave further insight to the matter's intentions of the heart. Good. Who is Glenisha? Oh, she did, oh, this is too much. she did come with the last time. Oh, well, Glenisha, it was nice for you to remember that. It's a pity you weren't here to say that openly. But you have said it nonetheless, and we have recognized. Mm. Where is Glenisha? On Facebook oh, or Facebook. Hmm? Facebook. YouTube? Facebook. Facebook. Okay. All right. So, somebody, please read chapter 15. Chapter 14. Verses 15 through 24, I think. Yeah. When one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Parable of the dinner. But he said to him, A man was given a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all, precious Jesus, but they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look, it. look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said to him, I bought five yoke of oxen. And I am going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said to him, I have married a wife. And for that reason, I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out to the highways and byways and along the hedges and uh, compel okay. them to come in so that my house might be filled. For I tell you, none of these men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. So, Jesus uses a banquet 
as an illustration for an invitation into the kingdom. It's a banquet of feasting. In a banquet, a banquet is a place of happiness. There is joy. There is fellowship. There is togetherness. There are people. And this is an open invitation. This is an open invitation to the Jewish people. Came unto his own, and his own. You were not receiving. His enough. own. Received them not. Okay, two persons know that verse. <laughs> his own received them not, but as many as, as many as received them, to them gave he power. the power, the authority to become sons of God. They had rejected Jesus. Mm. And he's given the illustration of an open banquet. Now, you have to understand that in the culture of the time, when there was a banquet, when somebody was invited to a wedding feast or a banquet, they would be given a general time for this to happen. A general time, not, not a specific date and a specific time like how we do things now. Because a banquet was a large spread, so as soon as it was ready, the slave would go out again and he would say to them, hey, where things are ready, come now. They would be preparing for that general time. As it turns out, nobody declined. Mm. Everybody wanted to come. So it seems because nobody RSVP saying they could make it. And here it is now that the food is ready. Everything is prepared. There is no turning back. You ever put on a dinner yet and invite 10 persons? I did. <laughs> and just before the dinner to start, five of them called to say them can't make it. Huh? It, you know what it costs to put on that dinner? Can I tell you? The effort, the money, and the disappointment in your saying you can't make it. It usually is because you are thoughtless. Unless it's a case of an emergency. But you don't get invited to something, say you're coming, and just don't, don't, don't just turn up. So here they are. It's time, and the slave goes out again. And he says, hey, it's time. And they start to give him a bag of excuses. A bag of excuses. Excuses that don't stand up. Excuses, excuses that at the face of it are legitimate. ridiculous. And they're trying to make it look legitimate. The first one. Yeah. The first one. He comes and he says, hey, I bought five oxen. Is that it or a field? F bought a field. Land, yeah. And I have to go look at it. I know you have read it, but it probably never dawned on you. Nobody buys land without knowing what it looks like. Nobody don't buy puss in bag. So how is he buying land? How he knows that it's not some local gully they sold him? Right? That he has not visited to see that. He says, I've bought the land, but I, haven't, I need to go look at it. And on the face of it, it sounds legitimate, but it's really stupid. Yes, yeah. he's now the owner of Make this sure land. All right. It's too late, he can't give it back. What if it's foolishness? He would have looked at it before. So the, 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 the person who sends out the invitation would have known immediately that this man is spurning him. This man do have no legitimate reason to turn it down. But how often we use excuses like that for service. Come now, let's get it to our time. How often we use, how is the application to us? How often we use some foolish excuse as to why we can't? How often? How often we use the same business excuse? I have work. Uh, we don't reach that one yet. <laughs> I have work. I have school. I have exam. You know? You come up with those excuses. You know, boy, you know, um, I have a test preparing for tomorrow. I have a deadline that I have to meet. It's funny how you place emphasis on these things, but the same emphasis is not given to the things of God. 
How often I've heard the young folks telling me, oh, pastor, you, you don't see me because I'm studying for exam. So in your studying, you can't give up two hours for church, for fellowship, something that is going to benefit you directly. But you, you sit back and you feel good excuse. You know, same thing with people at work. You have a deadline to meet. Okay. And you want to tell me that you can't give up two hours? You don't do the work, yeah, yeah, first of all, it, it, most times it demonstrates poor planning. But what if, you know, the deadline just come up? No deadline don't just come up, so. You know what you're doing? We use these excuses before God and we honestly think that they stand. But what in fact you are doing, just like this guy, is saying to God, hey, you're not that important. Your dinner is not worth it. Can't bother come. Can't bother come. That's the excuse they gave the slave then the next one turn that down the next one is he bought five oxen and he needs to try them out this man is obviously what wealthy how we know him wealthy well he buy five cow one time cow prices haven't changed much <laughs> you know much a cow today much as to buy five one time this man would have not only been wealthy, but because of his wealth, he would have had what? Servants. And in normative cases, his servant is the one who tests the oxen. Mm -hmm. Or if you go and buy him up and you test it. When you have full-time work, people working with you. You buy the map, you bring it to him, and you say, try that map, I hear it good, don't it? Tell the truth and shame the devil. You don't get involved with those things. But he doesn't want to come either. So he's slighting it. You know, it is the, the novelty of newness that he's given as an excuse. More of them new, I have to test them out. Show them work. And sometimes we use the same novelties. We get a new car. And boy, from me get the car, nobody will see you again. It's almost like we need to pray that God send you back to bus. <laughs> you know. And I'm telling you, there are sometimes we ask God for stuff. And God doesn't give it to us because he knows that you're going to prioritize it over him. You know. Um, new job new school, new this, so you can't come. And then the third one is the one that I find amazing. Because most of you are going to sit down and agree with this one. He says, I married a wife. That's the prior family. <laughs> family important. Ah, yes. You know, I've heard That's this one. <laughs> let's, let's hear it again. What you guys just said? Family important. Family Prioritize my family. That's yes. my ministry. No, family is important. I agree. But in chapter 15, we're going to see the importance of family over God. Chapter 15. 14. Yeah, as a matter of fact, coming up mm -hmm. is the next verses. We're going to see the importance of family over God. So let's not even jump that one. Let's make it stay till we get there. But here's what is silly about it. The Pharisees would have laughed if anybody came to them about that. In the Jewish culture at the time, women weren't important. Not important enough for you to cancel anything over. At the culture at the time, they would have said, this is what I'm talking about. Man, sit down about you going to look about wife wouldn't have been important. So you understand how ridiculous the excuse appeared to Christ. We sometimes use that 
Lord, uh, the wife say, and Lord, the husband say. And I keep saying, you know, no greater example than that of a husband and wife actively engaged and involved and committed to God. No greater example. No greater example for their children. No greater example in the church. When you have one partner committed and the other one not committed, children view that in a certain light. And guess whose side them take most of the time? That's right, the one who not coming to church. Um, the, the parable that Jesus um, raises here, interestingly, is, is one that talks about the kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, and we were hearing about um, land and wife and co and, and all them something there. So, and sometimes we're stuck there. It's one about the kingdom. And he's, I see him raising some important points. Important points in the parable that exposes the heart of those who treated the invitation with the kind of dishonor disregard and disrespect that they did right and pastor just made the point about the cultural context in which this parable is being told at the surface of it we really do see these concerns that the people had the invitees had as legitimate a man just have him woman oh upon him honeymoon and you don't call him to your party him have honeymoon to enjoy right that is legitimate you've just made an investment in in your your farm and you want to make sure that things are okay a party is something so frivolous legitimate on the surface and these are the things, our own issues, are the things that we often prioritize. Not the kingdom of God. Not the things concerning God. Not even his requirements for how we must live do we prioritize. But we prioritize the things that we want to prioritize because it is beneficial to us and to our flesh immediately and it's not just the prioritizing that that is of concern and of note and we don't get here by prophesying and i want to set up the point but it's the consequence of their priority that is something too of note and of the excuses that they found to me and have tricked themselves into thinking that it is a legitimate excuse for why they did not attend. And we too, sometimes unknowingly, trick ourselves into thinking that way. And you want to know how it is successful? Because we have not yet agreed with God on what his standard for our life should be. We don't to agree, we still have some discomfort and disagreement with what God says. There, there's a line in this that has caused the church great embarrassment. The line where he says, compel them. We read that, or especially in ancient church history, they read that and thought it Course. meant to forcefully bring them in. Yeah. The decision to serve and to believe on the Lord is entirely free. It is not a comp the only compelling being done is that of the Holy Spirit. Where the Holy Spirit compels you and you have no alternative uh, because of this compulsion and willingly believe. But to compel them to come is not a compelling to force anybody into service. The compelling was 
to persuade them to come. And this persuasion was no longer to the people who should have already been persuaded. This is, pers this is persuasion now to the people who them bucking up on the street and say, come. But we don't have no clothes, come man, come the same way. Come. But look how we stay. We don't know nobody, come the same way. Come as you are. Come. This persuasion is to those who they once looked down on and called them dogs and, and thought they weren't worthy of the kingdom of God and couldn't be righteous. This is those now that he's gone out to and he's saying to them, come, come. Some of you are sitting on some things and, and you're not coming. You're not doing anything with it. You have your gift and, you know, you, well, well you just, you just, you're just not doing it right. There's no conviction about what you're doing. You know, there's no compelling for this. And, um, um, in church history, um, the, the Roman emperor, what's his name again? Nero. No, no, Nero. Um, um, hmm? he, he was one who compelled people to come and would beat them and imprison them and um, he was a, a Christian. Um, start with A. Um, ooh, I can't remember his name. Um, Augustine. Augustine tried to imprison people. He was passionate about Christ. But this is not the way that passion works. We can't force you to do anything. We can strongly encourage you. But we can't force you to come. We, you know, and, and believers know that and tend to act on that. In Augustine's time and in early church history, they did all sorts of things that, that embarrassed the church. It wasn't God who told them to do these things by misapplying this. Today, it is not so much like that, but people do a lot of persuasion by embarrassment too. Here it was punishment and the threat of death and imprisonment so people would come, but they did not believe. They weren't believers. See? Why can't we compel you to come? Why can't I say to you, hey, you have this gift. Come use it. Why can't I do that? Besides not having the authority. Why does God not compel you? Say it all the time, you know. God will not compel you because obedience is the highest act of worship. And when you willingly comply to what he has called you to, then that is your act of worship. So he's not going to come and beat you across the head and say you should have gone a long time. And we have tried by using persuasive arguments to tell people, get actively involved. You have been blessed with a gift. Use it. Whatever it is that you have, use it for the Lord. And too often people but we can't compel you. And the church must not compel anybody to be involved in anything. You must be persuaded by your own convictions and come and get involved and be committed. That leads to the next section. Because he's just talking about those not coming to the banquet. And Jesus now is on his way to Jerusalem. By the way, all that preaching Jesus just did was at the Pharisees' house. He used any platform that became available to preach no, the gospel. No, that, that is a teaching point. Yeah. Go ahead. If, I, I, if you miss anything, I'll bring it because that's going to use it. Go ahead. No, that, that is a, 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 
a point to stick a pin that Jesus used any platform that he had to teach and to preach the kingdom. I think because we, in today's society, we tend to dichotomize and compartmentalize our lives. So this platform here is for church and churchical things. But this platform over here, because it is secular, it is for non churchical things and secular things. So we don't consider that I am a believer. When we talk about new life, I found a new life, we just sing it as a song. But we don't take it that I'm a believer who is now operating as a teacher in the classroom. Mm. We, I'm a teacher in the classroom here. I'm a, a believer in church. Or I am a believer who is now operating in, in this space and on this platform. And so this platform is an opportunity that God has given mm -hmm. me. Yeah. You know, we don't see it as that. So, so that is the, is the teachable moment there because we compartmentalize our lives so much. And that's why perhaps we have so many faces and sides of us that... that you yeah. don't recognize us in different settings. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember I was sharing on Sunday and talking about when I first started JTS, the idea of full-time ministry and how it has changed. Because it used to be, you're doing this, you're moving away from something secular into mm -hmm. this sacred part, right? Mm -hmm. But the truth is, each of us are in full-time ministry because each of us, in our lives, that's our ministry. So you are... Uh, developer your your ministry is there right it continues wherever you go and so just like how Jesus used this moment where he's having dinner with these persons and teaching and then he goes now when we're going to talk about it with the crowd he's still teaching we each have our part to play wherever we go to continue but how often has, has society told us and we told ourselves that this space is an inconvenient space mm. to have this kind of conversation mm. about Jesus. And we've managed to convince ourselves too. Yeah, and we've so been shamed into not using whatever platform that we mm. have yeah. to be able to communicate the message of who we are, whose we are, and the particular way that we're called to be and to show up. Because we bought into that. Yeah. I want to give you an example of exactly that. Mm -hmm. um, Tony Evans was invited to speak, to pray at a, a, a function, a Christmas function, put on by the, the council, the city council. And so they are ecumenical in their approach to prayer they will invite all and sundry from any religion to pray. It just so happened that he got the invitation. the invitation to come and pray. And before he prayed, they warned him. They said, listen, you can't mention the name of Jesus. You, you can say God, but you can't talk about God in light of the Bible. Because you're going to offend a number of persons that are here so you when you pray you have to be um, um, general in your prayer um, you you can't be specific to God in this prayer most of us would have said well we're not coming then he took the opportunity to go what am I talking about I'm talking about Jesus being at the Pharisees house and it would have been the least place of places to hear him say anything. They, they've been trying to get rid of him for so long. And here he comes knowing fully well what this is about, but sees it as an opportunity to speak about the kingdom of God. So Tony Evan goes up and they welcome him and he starts to pray. And he says, Lord God, we thank you for this occasion where we ought to remember your son 
But Lord, I'm told that I cannot mention him by name. But this would have been an opportunity, Lord, to give you thanks for your son, Jesus, who came at Christmas, whose name I shouldn't mention. And the fact that he came and gave his life so we could all celebrate this your his coming but i can't give you thanks lord i would thank you for the blood that was shed and for the real reason of christmas but we are told not to say anything about it and in that prayer he gave the the entire gospel and when it was done he says and lord because i couldn't say too much amen <laughs> But he used opportunity. the opportunity. Many of us would have been, well, you know, this is a high opportunity. Yeah. It's political. We can't use it like that, less in case. Instead of seeing how we can spread the gospel. Jesus went to the Pharisees' house <coughs> with a gathering of Pharisees and spoke the word. How much would you do that? Chapter 15, go and focus on that. Chapter 15 is all about that. Please in the crowd. Mm -hmm. But let's finish chapter 14. Uh, Jesus is on his way where? Jerusalem. What's happening at Jerusalem? Jerusalem is where Jesus is going to die. Jerusalem is the cross. Jerusalem is the ultimate destination. We're talking about destination and purpose. It's the ultimate destination so that he could fulfill his purpose of coming on earth. So Jesus was on his way. Most people who are following him thought that, you know, he was going so that he can be crowned. So that he could be lifted up. Remember when he got into Jerusalem, what happened? What happened? Hint, Palm Sunday. Yes. What happened? Yeah. They were crowning him. Hosanna, Lord, help, we pray. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Because they thought that was his purpose. But here, Jesus is vividly telling those that are following him that this is not a path to wealth and glory and self-aggrandizement. Um, this is not the path. He's telling them that this part of following him is not about what they going to get, but what they must give up. And he's about to get into that. He's about to get into that. And he comes to the crowd, the crowd. The crowd has grown tremendously. Why? Well, there was fish and bami for one day. There's healing for one time. There is so much to see. This is like the side show in a circus. Woo! Everybody and them children coming. Oh, come, pack up bags. We're going. See this little boy? His mother pack a basket for him to stay all day. Why? Entertainment galore. There's not a boring moment with him. And so the crowd kept growing and was coming what are you following jesus for today is a question uh, that we have to ask ourselves why am i here somebody man left and i you know <laughs> i've said that jesus did a thing that was reckless and careless when it comes to growth yeah. you would have thought that he would have capitalized on the crowd but it's not about the amount who follows it is about those who are dedicated those who are determined those who are dependable 
And so he's shifting the crowd. And you understand what I mean by shifting? Some of you never seen a body build anything yet. But shifting was a process that they would use to, to, to get fine sand to the final dressing on a building. Yeah, you know sift. what I'm talking about, um, Nathaniel? Sift. Yes, Not shifting, shifting. It, no, it's, you call it sieving. Uh -huh. The thing named sieve. It don't name sieving. It's shifting. No. Not they are shifting through the thing like this. Right? So anyhow, regardless of through this protest. Sand. It's sifting. It ah, it's, you get the fine sand. Whatever, whether you sift it or you shift it, you get the fine sand. <laughs> right, that's so the they part. get there and you put things in. It's called shifting because you're doing that with it. Oh. Hi. Oh. You see, this is the problem. We want shifting. to. Yeah. You know what? Let me call it something. Else. Shaking. <laughs> Find a problem with that too. Shaking it. <coughs> See? To get the sand that can come through the, the, the mesh out and to keep back the rubble. Soon tell me it's not rubble, it's rubble. <laughs> right? To keep back the rubble because what is important is the quality of the fine sand that comes out. He's about to save them. And he's laying down the rules. There is a, and I know these guys well prepared with this part, so I'm going to give them the opportunity to talk. There is a story that, that Barclay tells of a popular lecturer who gave a lecture. And as the crowd gathered, you know, wanting to push there, one young man, you know, boasted how he was a student. And so when the person got up closer to the lecturer, he says, oh, I know one of your students, so and so. He said he was one of your students. And the professor said, oh, he might have come to a lecture, but he's not my student. Uh -oh. mm. I don't know if you get that. Yeah. Some of us are attending lectures, that's, that's, but we are not students. Some of us are followers, but we are not disciples. That's the point that Jesus is making. He's saying that discipleship <coughs> is more than a run of the mouth. Discipleship is more than what you say. Discipleship is more than a brag or a t-shirt that marks something. Discipleship is more than being a member of Ecclesia Bible Fellowship or any other church for that matter. Discipleship is more than being baptized. Discipleship has specific requirements and is shifting. And they're still whispering sitting yeah. over there, you know. He's shifting the church because he wants those that are dependable those that are dedicated those that have determination it's not about what you think it's not about wealth and prosperity because some are even called to die for this cause some will have to give up wealth and everything else for this cause. All rewards are not necessarily on this side. We talked about Joseph. Joseph was a made prince so that he could drive the royal chariot and command people to bow at him. Joseph was made prince for the specific purpose of preserving his brothers. Sometimes we get it twisted. Because God gave a little something on the side. They say, oh, well, this is what all of us must get. So I'm turning over to you guys, because I know you're well prepared on this one. Yes, but um, I'm going to make a mere delve into that. I just want to um, back up a little. Um, there's a little bit of, of irony, but Jesus still remaining on the same kind of trend here too. In the parable prior to, to where he's coming with these crowd who are who's following him, 
it seemed like he wanted the crowd not so because him sent to as the people and they don't come so now he go and send to and invite tooth moon tooth bagai everybody to the to the feast remember that parable we just come out of this one we're heading into another part of the story where the whole heap of people following but now he's saying mm -mm, go back go back go back we're not ready for all of that yet but in both situations he's cutting at the heart of those people who are intended to be part of the kingdom or followers the first set of people their response their heart their priorities were not there the second piece of per set of persons he's asking them to interrogate where your heart is because this life that we're called to live is a matter of the heart and over to you Amir, now to unpack verse 25 onward this whole call to discipleship <laughs> well i like how you put it um a matter of the heart um, and that's what jesus was really getting at speak up that's what jesus was really getting at with the idea of being his disciples and so we see that he's now talking to the crowd this large crowd that was following him and like what pastor is saying he's sifting through everyone who <laughs> who yeah but you understand he sit through the crowd right and he gives a couple of situations in which persons cannot be considered his disciples so these are large crowds that are following him and he's now cutting it down and the first one that he says is if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father mother wife and children and brothers and sisters yes and even his own life he cannot be my disciple harsh don't it you have to hate these persons in order to be the disciple of christ it's, it seems something antithetical to who god is god is a god of love god calls for us to love one another so how can we know come into this how can we be considered his disciple if we hate our family if we hate those who are close to us if we hate even ourselves when you look at even the greatest commandment you know love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and love your neighbor as yourself we see god talking about love in that way but he's bringing this point to us that you have to hate these persons in order to be his considered his disciple now the, the key point in this is understanding the word hate this hate doesn't mean the hatred that we, we we talk about it's really a comparative the love that you have for god it comparing it or in comparison to the love that you have for these persons would make it look like hatred in such a way so your love for god should be so high that when it comes to your brothers and sisters and your wife and your husband and your family and even yourself that love looks like hatred and that's the f oh. yeah i understand where you're going mm -hmm. um i want to sort of kind of remove the word hatred from the the conversation and the understanding mm -hmm. but first to understand the separation of degrees that we must place between god and anything else that we adore that is the point the separation of degrees there must not be god and any close second yeah nothing should be rivaling god for primacy or preeminence in our lives for that number one spot and the thing is like we saw previously there were a number of things rivaling for the attention of these people who were invited who had them call who had woman who had land that they needed to go and watch to see if river flow through all them kind of something that were important 
And so those things, it was easy for those things to creep into the place of priority. And so now you are being told that if you are to be my disciple, the degree of separation between the things that you hold dear and the things that you prioritize and me must be far. Nothing must clo come a close second. And so the question posed to us tonight is what degree of separation is there between God and those things that we hold dear in our lives? What competes with him? What thing could creep into that top position? And if we're honest with ourselves, we perhaps will say that the degree of the separation isn't very wide. And that's why we struggle. And I say we, because I'm not talking at you, because I have the struggle sometimes. We struggle with the whole idea as to what is God's purpose will for my life. Because we're still bringing back the my life in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you understand? He says even your very own life. Not just your mother, father, brother, mm -hmm. dog. And post your own life. And that is the question we ought to contemplate. That degree of separation. Because we don't get it when we talk about it compares to my see my seed. Because none of us really hate our brother and our thing, no matter how much they do us bad things, I hope. But that degree of separation, where is that? Yeah. Do you want to continue? No, when I was reading it, and like you said, the thing that kept, that was playing in my mind is, how does this look like? How does this love to God look like in comparison to my love to others? How, how, how am I going to act this out? You no. Know? And, and as you say, it's a struggle. Well, you have the perfect opportunity to ask how that look like. Mm. What? Well, you could compare the loves in your life mm. and look at or the things you do to maintain the different loves in your life. Are you as intentional and involved? Are you as intentional and involved uh, with your God, who is supposed to be the number one love in your life, with the other things that you give your attention to? Are you as committed? Are you as dedicated? Do you place the same care in remembering and giving attention to and investing in mm. as you do with the other loves in your life? It's the, it's the opportunity we have, you know, right. not just to, to, to say the words, but to, 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 to put it in our liberty, my everyday life. How am I showing up with these things as opposed to God? I find that as people, we're not very reflective. We're just always going on to the next. But we don't pause and reflect on self and on me. And how it is that I am showing up in this walk that I'm called to. So you could do a quick assessment mm -hmm. in terms of knowing what that would look like. By just looking at the everyday regular things. When I say you, I don't mean you. No, I'm here. All of us. Yeah. And if we find ourselves lacking, then that just means no, we're correct. Yes. yes. I, I think you play it down a little bit, Amir. Mm. I don't think you emphasize like Jesus emphasized. Because you, you, you're saying it, but you're not getting to the last part of it. You cannot. What is what? You cannot be his disciple. You can't be my disciple. <laughs> you know, so it's not a matter of it is a matter of a compulsion of putting him first. Yeah. And, and who is the first that we normally put first? 
ourselves. Ourselves, yes. And that's why he put that last. Because you know you're going to get constrained with your parents and your wife and your husband and everything. But the one person we're not um, constrained with is us. And he said, yes, even you, I must go so far from you that when you compare your love for me to you, you know, it's almost like love and hate. I'm not telling to hate them, it's comparatively speaking. Or else, you can't be my disciple. Makes me wonder which one of us qualifies to be his disciple. And the point is, he has called us to be disciples. But we shall decide. <laughs> Isn't it? Working on the pull. Working on the pull. Isn't it? There, there is, there, this, listen, listen, guys. Listen, listen. Don't take this lightly. Don't take this lightly. This is one of those moments when Jesus just stopped the crowd and said, Listen, man, check yourself. Yep. Check yourself. And, and I want us to stop and check ourselves. Check yourself. Is he really first? Because if he's not, you're not his disciple. Matthew 28, 20, make disciples. Is he first? Is he prioritized? Or everything else come? And then somewhere down the line. So, listen, I've, let's, 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 you know, let's not even bother talk. Because I've heard so many excuses. And one of the biggest ones why he started is family. Family comes first. We say that in the church. Family is important, but family don't come first. Let me say that one more time, and then you can always stone me. Family is important, but it doesn't come first. Christ does. That's what the Bible says. He comes first. Or else you can't be his disciple. Read it for yourselves. Some of you sit down and I know you look at me. He can't go on talk. It's not me writing. It says not me can't go on talk. It's Jesus. Stop it. And every time we put them first, we're saying to God, we're not prioritizing you. Girlfriend, boyfriend, can't come first. And you know what is amazing about this? When I look at it and I say, Lord, this is a tough one. Because it is in the hard sayings of Jesus. It's listed in amongst them as the hard sayings of Jesus. You know, when I check it out, what, what I realize, I realize if we do it according to what Jesus said, then wife going get treated like her wife must be treated. Husband going get treated like her husband must be treated. Children, sons and daughters going get treated like her. They must be treated. Why? Because the Bible has a mandate as to how they must be treated. Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wife. And if we love Christ and put him first, guess what we're going to do? Love your wife. Exactly like how the Bible says must love them. And if, 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 if God is first in our lives, guess what we're going to do? We're going to, wives are going to submit just like how him say must be. So it is to the benefit of us that we do so. So wives, please start telling your husbands, love God more than you love me. But, but you see, therein is the, is the deceit because there is benefit to obeying Christ, right? But we always act in our self-interest and that which benefits our flesh but is detrimental to oh. us. And there is a it. way in which that we read and judge and decipher benefit that is destructive. It may be in us our self-interest, but that which is in our self-interest is not necessarily beneficial to us. And we make those kinds of decisions all the time the decisions that suit our interest rather than suit our benefit in the long run and therein is the deceit in 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 just the, the world view that surrounds us and the need for the renewal of our mind and we cannot overstress that there are some comments on facebook first from glenisha some will say 
how you operate and treat your family is a reflection of your relationship with God. What would you say about that? A reflection of our relationship with God, based on what the Word says, is when He's first. When He's first, everything else falls into its proper perspective. Mm -hmm. When he's first, every no, no, you have got to understand him being first, though, means a boy, you're at every service. Like how some people would treat it. I know ladies who, when it comes to this time of year, and there is the so called 40 day period of fasting that some churches have established, they come home and they tell the husband, Shop lock. I didn't even know you had a shop, much less to lock it. You know? That is ungodly. Because the Bible says the only time you must withhold yourself from each other is when you both agree to do it. And for a time of prayer. And you both must agree. So one can come and say, this is what is happening. See? A reflection of our walk with Christ is when we prioritize him. And everything else falls into place. Because husbands must see to the welfare of their wives. Parents must see to the spiritual development and welfare of their children. Employees then turn around and start treating their em employers, then turn around and start treating their employees in a proper perspective. When we prioritize God, everything else falls into place. Is our failure to prioritize him. And then we come up with the excuse. Well, the Lord would want me to look about my family. Of course he does. He says if you're not looking about them, you're worse than an infidel. But he wants you to put him first. Because putting him first ensures that you're walking in what? Obedience to the word. Otherwise, there's no guarantee. No guarantee. <laughs> the struggle with putting God first. Mm. The struggle with putting God first is about then what's about me? Mm -hmm. What's about my need? Yeah. You fall into place too. Yeah. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what? All, All things. things will be added. You think God hand short in anything? Okay. Yeah. There's another comment by Leroy. What is also important is for us to know that we can be a believer but not a disciple. The fact we have been saved by grace does not mean we are living to please God. Living or walking in obedience is a choice. We are not optimizing our relationship with God. Yep. Oh, by the way, Millicent, I guess, is watching from online. So she sent me something Send and I'm sure she wants me to read it. <laughs> I can see her at home smiling where she says, oh, she sent me something where it, it um, you have a question? Oh, you just praise him, God. I praise the Lord, sister. Where she's, 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 the, she's given the meaning of shiv because that's getting into people's mind and some of them can't get over it, you know? Um, what's the difference between shift and shiv? Um, the long and short of it to shift to put a fine or loose substance to a sieve to sit. so as to remove lumps or large particles to what? shift no it's sit <laughs> to shift S-H-I-F-T and I'll ask her to send it to all of you please Millie because them things are making it up um, okay <laughs> so when I tell you one thing and you sit on there and I'm arguing over foolishness rather than hear the, the truth of the thing that puts it to rest now hopefully and some people go and ask we should find that we need to see that for ourselves so maybe send it to all your friends they can share it with each other go on oh by the way I, I looked up the word um, cannot because some of us might think that because the Bible says um, hate and is not literal, cannot is not I literal too. I oh. looked it up. <laughs> I've gone to the finest Greek grammatical structures of the sentence. 
I've looked through the best commentaries, and you know what I've come to realize? It means that you will never, won't happen, zilch, zilch, never happen. You cannot become his disciple. There's no pulling back on that. Go on, my friend. All right. So verse 27 says, whoever does not carry his own cross oh, we better stop. and come after me cannot be my disciple. We're going to stop at that one. Uh, right. <laughs> because we have just a few minutes and we will not finish that one in a few minutes. Just to say that, you know, to get you excited about it, it is not what you think it is. Yeah. It's not what you think it is. So we'll get into that one next week. Try not to miss it. For those online, we thank you for having joined us. Find it back. I'm trying to bring somebody with you. Yeah, well, you, you know, I know the place, so I can get full. We have chairs. But we have more chairs around the back. And if you notice, you're a little bit far from us, we can pull you up further. You know, we can probably go back to the time when you were sitting right at the foot. Mm -hmm. You know, so you can bring that back so that we have space going back to the wall. You know, and Desia tells me the moment the place full like that, she's the first one to buy two or three more chairs, <laughs> and the rest will follow. Thank you for setting that example, Desia. Really appreciate that and that promise. But the place can be filled. Um, and we invite you know, to the study of God's word. God bless you. See you on Sunday. See you on Sunday at 8 a.m. and, and 10 at 10 a.m.